This is Alexandra villaruela Abrego and welcome to another episode of Alexandra TV. A few weeks ago, I had the immense pleasure of interviewing Til Swan. Til Swan is an internationally recognized spiritual leader and a new influential voice in the field of metaphysics. If you've ever Googled anything that has to do with spirituality, or even if you typed on YouTube, spiritual or spirituality, the words, well, you have most probably stumbled upon her amazing channel called The Spiritual Catalyst, where every single week she answers questions from her viewers. Since we have just started the month of February, which is the month of Valentine's Day, I decided to interview Til Swan about the topics of relationships, sexuality, feminine and masculine energy, really topics that are, I find, completely fascinating. So without any further ado, let's watch the interview. Hi everyone, this is Alexandra Villaruela Abrego and thank you so much for tuning in to another Alexandra TV episode. Today, as you can see, we have a very special guest with us. It's Teal Swan. She is one of the number one spiritual leaders in the world. If you have been on her channel, you know that there's topics about all kinds of topics, really about spirituality. We have about relationships. We have about all kinds of amazing, interesting topics. So today, Teal is here to start off the month of February, which is going to be a month of relationships, uh, relationship topics, really. So we're going to talk today more about the spiritual side of relationship, which I really love. I think that there's a lot of relationship ad adv advice out there, but there's not a lot of uh, spiritual sometimes relationship advice, which I think is so important. So first of all, thank you so much, Teal, for, uh, for being here, for your time. I know you're very busy, so thank you very much for that. So tell us a little bit to, to start off about your journey, how it all started, so that people who are not familiar with you, they, they get more familiarized. How it all started. I was born weird. No. Um, <laughs> yes. Okay, so basically how it all started is that I was born on this planet without filters. So the average person who's down here interacting with the 3D reality, that's the only reality that they perceive. And our brains were designed that way. So it was designed, they were designed to interact with the physical, to interface with the physical, and not to have too much blending of other dimensional realities, even though they exist. But I was born without those filters, so I'm actually seeing over, an overlapping of, of dimensions. And what they call that is extrasensory. So as a child, I was seeing auras, I was talking to disincarnate entities, I was able to act as a medical intuitive, being able to see inside people's bodies. That's just some of, it, of the different, you could call them abilities, it really felt like a disability when I was younger that I came in with, and my parents didn't know what the hell to do with that. They were like, okay, we're scientific people, we have no way of explaining this, it sounds sort of spiritual, but we don't know whether something's really wrong with this kid. Mm -hmm. So, I think my parents were real frustrated with what to do, and they ended up getting a job in the remote wilderness of Utah, and they didn't understand how religious this particular area was. And uh, so when I came into town, as a typical kid, you don't know that anybody's different than you, right? So I started talking about the stuff that I was seeing, all the spiritual dimensions, you know. And I was freaking people out because basically the mainstream demographic in Utah is Mormon. And they believe in, in things like I was seeing and doing. Only those types of things are called powers of priesthood. Oh, yeah. But powers of priesthood can only be held by men. Mm -hmm. So if they're held by women, it's a gift of the devil. So I was ostracized from the community immensely. My whole family was, I was not allowed to play with kids in the community. I was not allowed in people's houses, kicked out of carpools. A lot of my teachers had issues with me, sent me to the principal's office. So it wasn't going well. And that would have been bad enough. But the real issue started when there was a cult group there that also caught wind of me in town. And unlike the Mormons who believe in turn the other cheek, they believe that it's their direct job to rid the earth of evil. So their belief essentially because of these abilities I had was that I was a demon that had taken over the body of a little girl. So my parents didn't know that one of their loose family acquaintances was a part of this particular cult and was also, I mean, on top of being a part of the cult was very mentally unsound. He had multiple personalities. He was what you would consider a genuine psychopath, somebody who has antisocial personality disorder. So um, he ended up infiltrating my family as my mentor. And 
look, I know, I know what to do with all these abilities, and I can help her with the IMT, I have a report, so just let her go with me. I actually did that, but essentially, go ahead and let me come into her, um, and underneath their noses, without them 100% getting it or, why, or noticing the signs, I had to endure 13 years of really severe sexual, physical, and emotional abuse by this man. And, I mean, it was bad. It was real, real bad. It's one of those scenarios that you would most likely see on the news. And I ended up escaping from that situation when I was 19 years old, wanting nothing to do with spirituality ever again. As you can imagine, I was just like, screw it! This stuff destroyed my life! I want to do anything besides this! And so I threw myself into professional sports. Okay. And um, it wasn't until years later that I ended up realizing, look, I'm never, I'm never going to be able to get rid of this stuff that I see and that I do. And so I either embrace it or live a life of absolute torment. Yeah, yeah. So I decided to turn back in the direction of it. I started seeing people again one-on-one. -on -one. And it was blowing my mind how much people didn't know about the way that the universe functioned. Yeah. It was blowing my mind about what they didn't know about illness and how illness manifests in the body. And I was loving teaching. Like, to my surprise, not only was this fun, it was like the best thing ever. So I totally fell in love with it. And I wrote a book because I wanted to reach a larger audience. And that book really took off. And then I started a YouTube series, which is still going today, which really took off, and my career sort of exploded from there. And so here I am with this giant international career now as a spiritual leader, teaching people how to survive even the most extreme circumstances. Wow, that's amazing. What a story, huh? It's, it's, it's <laughs> great to see how anyone, no matter what the circumstances are, they can take whatever negative situation, they can really turn it around. So that's, that's amazing. Congratulations to you for, for you. everything. Uh, for First of all, for surviving everything, but for taking that and turning it into something so wonderful. Now. Your channel, what it has uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, you know, you have followers from around the world, so it's really, really amazing. Now, I know a lot of people listening, you know, in, in the field, I, I am the field of coaching and personal development, so I know some, sometimes a lot of people who listen to stories like yours are going to say, oh, this is a little too much, but I really want people, anyone who's watching, please stay open-minded to this, because I think that this is completely fascinating, and I really... I always say that it's body, mind, and spirit. So there is a spiritual world, and we need to really be open-minded to that. You shared your story about your abuser. I remember watching one of your videos where you, you say that with that abuser, you kind of had a contract that was signed. Uh, so we're going to start talking about that because I think this is that's very interesting when it comes to relationships, how we all, before we enter this lifetime, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that's what you said, before we enter this lifetime, we sign spiritual contracts with people, mm -hmm. with sometimes our, our lovers, but also our enemies. So talk a little bit about that, because I think that's completely fascinating. Okay, so to start with, it's just possible that, that, that some of the people you line up with in life, you didn't have these arrangements before. You, you line up with them throughout the course of your life. However, what is also very common is that from non-physical perspective, before you come to this life, there has to be an intention for there to even be the conditions that create a life, like a physical life. So let's say that your intention for this life before coming into it is to understand freedom. And you've decided that's what's in alignment with your expansion. It serves every other aspect of this universe because from a higher dimension, oneness is the reality. So your expansion is my expansion ultimately. So it serves us to essentially all play a role in this saga that enables you to find freedom. And you can simultaneously play a role in a saga that helps me find love or whatever it is that I've been down here for. So we will play different roles in this saga, all of which are completely critical for you learning freedom. So one of those roles might be me as a spiritual teacher. Maybe you and I have this contract, essentially, where I will provide information which will bring you closer to um, what freedom is. Another thing, though, is that you've got beings that will play the, what we would, could call the antagonist role. They're the ones that are going to, through contrast, teach you about freedom. So this would be opting into a relationship with a mother who just can't see you for who you are and is like, no, you're going to do exactly what I want you to do because I decided my daughter would always do this. And so um, what happens on, a, on a, this sort of higher dimensional level before you come to this planet is that you make an agreement or set an intention to line up in life as these characters so that you can facilitate expansion or learning in that way, fulfilling that particular role that you decide on, because playing that role will also facilitate your own expansion. So a lot of people, when they think about these pre-birth contracts, what they're imagining is like, 
is like a soul that's just like a glob of energy signing on a paper, but that's a very physical understanding. That's not how it works. Agreements are, it's more like a, an alignment that is set by intention. But it's very strong, of course, because from that dimensional level, we're not as influenced by changes, you know, as we are down here in the physical dimension. Right, right. Um, for, for when it comes to, to knowing, let's say, to, to learn and come to this world to learn something like you said, freedom or love, is there a way that we can know what, what that thing is? Like, is there a pattern that we can try to, to figure out? I don't know, I just thought about that because I think that's so interesting. Yeah, so we come down here to learn all kinds of things. I should get that out of the way. So, like, usually there's joint intentions or dual intentions or multiple intentions we have coming into one specific life. However, there's always what I call a core imprint. And the core imprint, I actually did a, two videos on this that are on my YouTube Called, it's called find your core imprint, find life purpose. Okay. What it is is that you start to look at your life with the negative theme that has continued to go on in your life, like the most negative feeling that continues to recur over and over again. Mm -hmm. And you, by virtue of finding that, you can look to the polar opposite of that vibration and know what it is you came here to basically do and look for. So let's say that somebody constantly finds themselves in isolation over and over again. That is a good indication that to the opposite degree of that, what you chose to come down here to learn, your primary lesson essentially was connection or something of the sort. I, was t I mean, I explained it in that video, and it might be interesting for people to go watch that, but that it's not, it's not like when you find that dominant negative imprint, it's always the exact opposite thing from that that you came here to learn. So um, I have people actually looking at thesaurus because those are super good to use because I want I want people to really um, identify with a, a very strong word for them personally okay. that may resonate with the opposite of whatever their core imprint is so so like let's say you know isolation mm -hmm. it would be obvious maybe that the exact opposite of isolation is connection but it might be that the exact opposite of isolation for somebody is festivity yeah. it's yeah. not just connection it's the celebration of connection that I want so um, and you'll know it. You'll know what it is, because I mean, the reality of of our lives is that that we came down, obviously, from these higher dimensional levels with full awareness of what our intention is. And so, this is more a process of remembering. So, I can guarantee you that when you start looking for what that core imprint is, it's going to be an aha moment. You're going to be like, "That's it. I just, I just know that that's it. I can feel it in my being." You know. And then it's a lot easier. I mean, I, th I think it's a great thing for people to find their core imprint because then you can really, like, focus intentionally focus. focus on that. Right. That's what yeah. Said. What is the name of the video again? Because I it kind of froze when you said it. It's called Find Your Core Imprint, Find Your Life Purpose. I'm going to write it. I'm going to go watch it. I need to, to, to find my core imprint. <laughs> now, going back on uh, contracts, on, uh, like, relationship contracts and agreements, when do you know when a contract is over? Uh, this we're, we're talking really with, let's say, your enemies, but also with your lovers, like with people that you go into relationships with. When do you know when it's over? Do you know it like when you finally reach that 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 core uh, thing that you have, or, or what, what is it? What, what's the moment that you know? There will be a feeling of completion. Okay. It'll feel like not all of your energy is invested anymore. Kind of like you've moved beyond it. And I mean, it's difficult to describe this because it is such a feeling base knowing. It's sort of like that day that you walk into the work, and it's not like you're really resistant to work anymore. It's not like you walk in the door and be like, oh my God, I hate this. I'm so ready to move. It just sort of feels like part of you is not there anymore. Okay. Okay. That's the feeling when a contract is finished. Okay, that's the feeling of when it's finished. I think that's really interesting. Yeah, but I don't, I don't need people. I don't think it's really essential for people to like have to know when these contracts are over with people or whatever because most of the time when we're asking that question, what it is is that we really want to be done with someone, you know? <laughs> and that's resistance, which is usually your indication that you're not done at all. In fact, you're in the process of creating even more of that. Yeah, exactly. But. Because what I've noticed, you know, and, and they always say that in the spiritual world is that when, let's say, you, you're going to end a relationship with someone that were meant to teach you a lesson, but you don't learn it, then you meet someone that's very similar that's going to teach you the same thing. So even if you think that, okay, it's over, I'm finishing this 
contract or whatever with this person at the end of the day the same person is going to come back in a different form so you know yep. talking about also uh well men and women but it doesn't really necessarily have to do with what men and women uh you talk a lot about the divine masculine the divine feminine i've spoke about it a little bit in, on my channel and people love it people want to know more people want to learn more about that so talk a little bit about the divine masculine the divine feminine i think especially uh, nowadays in this time that we're living in i think that's a very interesting topic to talk about Okay, so in the spiritual world, there's this idea that the the ideal is somebody who is androgynous. I mean, I don't know if you've run into that, but that's the basic, that's the standard idea. I mean, most people are like, oh, it's really great if you have a perfect balance within you of divine masculine and divine feminine. But I'm the kind of person who's going to say, wait, wait, hold the phone. The reason that you come in incarnated in a specific gender is so that you can experience the full expression of that particular gender. Right. So when we're talking about divine feminine or divine masculine, what we're really talking about is the, the um, highest and best expression of that particular energy. Right. So divine mas masculine and feminine is just an energy. It's a polarity. And there's nothing wrong with polarity. Polarity is amazing. In fact, if you, if you take two polar sides and unite them, you have a whole being, essentially. Which is a, a lot of what we wanted to experience was the sensation of that oneness through our relationships. Mm -hmm. So what we have to understand the most about, about Divine Feminine and Divine Masculine is it's first and foremost a way that energy expresses. So Divine Masculine expresses itself in a forward-moving and in an action-based way. Whereas Divine Feminine manifests in a sort of receptive and perceptive way. Mm -hmm. See how those are two different energy movements? Yeah. So if, if you have that core understanding of masculine and feminine, then it's pretty easy to see how even the physical expression follows that. Right. You've got women who, who basically, even during the sexual experience, receive, whereas the males move forward. Right. And <laughs> so what can happen if you start to really let yourself embody that particular energy that you came in as is that life starts to feel really super good for you. Because what we decided before we came into these genders is that we really fully want to experience that expression. Right. What happens with uh, women who are more masculine than feminine? Like I would say, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine, and especially in my work and the work that I do and having my business and everything, I, I realize that I'm, I'm, I have a lot more masculine energy uh, at times. You know, there's moments where I have more feminine energy. So what can I do to tap into my feminine energy to be more feminine. Okay. Um, basically, well, first of all, we should say that, that there's different balances of, of genders within people, but mostly when you see somebody who is, say, feminine but has a real masculinity to them, what has happened is that they come into this world, this world is skewed towards masculine, it's basically benefiting masculine more than feminine, but not in alignment masculine, out of alignment masculine. And so what women learn to do to survive in this world is to become more male instead of become more female. So some suggestions that I would have for women that would help them tap into their own divine femininity and really embody that essence that they came in with, first and foremost is to allow themselves to create. Because women are natural creators. This is part of why we create life. So basically you want to awaken your creative energies by doing any kind of art. Um, I actually suggested to women a, a while ago, if they have a real issue with, like, with this creativity or expression, that there is this book that's called The Artist's Way. It's by a woman named Julia Cameron, and you can read that book. She's got a lot of practical th things you can try if you're artistically blocked. The second thing is that you can collaborate and come together with other women. This is something which women have done for like centuries upon centuries, and it, it does a profound amount of work on, on us and our womanhood. Because right. we, we are gatherers. That's what yeah. women do. We gather people right. together and we hold the social group together. And so us deliberately doing that will wake up the divine feminine. Another aspect that we have to look at is to explore our own sensuality. Um, divine feminine is essentially beauty incarnate. So this is, this is the time for us to appreciate and celebrate beauty in our life, to create beauty in our life. Uh, what in our life reflects sensual pleasures? Mm -hmm. There is a reason why women are more drawn to, say, making the home really beautiful. It's because that is a natural expression for ourselves. Um, another thing, let me think about this. I think that another thing we have to do is to explore all of our attitudes towards motherhood. 
because, and especially towards our own mother, because nothing skews you out of divine feminine quite like a negative relationship with your mother. So those of us who had those types of negative relationships with mom really need to take a deep look into that. Um, another aspect is that we have to examine our current perspectives of womanhood, not only in our family, but also in the culture we grew up in and what we learned about what it means to be female. I encourage women to write a whole list of like what, what does it mean to be a woman. So for example, for some of us, being a woman might mean makeup, might mean high heels, might mean dresses, might mean wearing bras, might mean shaved armpits. We just want to examine everything that being a woman means to you specifically, regardless of whether it's right or wrong, ultimately it doesn't matter. It's your association. And then what I want you to do is to look down that list and decide whether each one of those is something that you want to have be about womanhood or whether you don't want it to have to be about womanhood. Because what you'll notice is we have a lot of positive associations with, with femininity as women and a lot of negative associations with femininity. So we have to look at both of those things and become super conscious of what that means to us. And I even assert, and I, I did a video on this, I have two videos, one is Divine Feminine, one is Divine Masculine, yet again on my YouTube channel. But what I encourage in that video, which I think is really smart, is to decide what you want Divine Feminine to be about. So I might decide, for me, Divine Feminine is about wearing bright colors. Okay. That's the expression of Divine Feminine for me. So if I want to awaken the Divine Feminine, what I'm going to do is to um, deliberately buy those outfits that, say, are more flamboyant, that are more colorful, and I'll start wearing those. Uh, if I, I might think, okay, wearing, wearing high heels, that's feminine to me. Do I like high heels, and do I really want that to be about femininity? I might decide yes, yeah. in which case I buy them. I might decide, hell no, in which case I don't buy them or I throw them away. And what you'll notice is that the, the way that Divine Feminine expresses through each individual woman is going to be completely different. So rather than saying, this is what maybe being a woman means ultimately, so if you're not that, then you're not being female, we have to, as individuals, say, how, what is my expression of Divine Feminine like? Is it in alignment with what I've been culturally taught and taught in my family, or is it in line with something else? So like I actually decided a while back that the expression of my own divine feminine is much more takes more the sort of expression and shape of what a typical Indian woman would look like. The divine feminine in me loves saris. I love the way the fabric moves and I love the sensuality. So basically that is more of what I allow my divine feminine to express itself like even though that's not my culture that I grew up in. Yeah, that's really nice. That's really good. Mm -hmm. in the, in the, uh, the new version of my book I had a chapter about the femininity and about also I think I would like to, to know your opinion on that about what would feminists, I consider myself a feminist, but there's, you know, the, not, not the extremists, but, but the peop, the women who watching this video would say, oh, well, that has nothing to do with being a feminine. Uh, how can you say that men give and that we receive, you know, how dare you know that they get really angry whenever we talk about this topic. There's sometimes there's a lot of women who agree. There's also a lot of women who are very angry and who don't agree at all. So what would you say? What would be your, your response to that? Well, I'm pretty, I'm pretty aggressive, actually, with that response. Because the reality is, is that there's nothing that has destroyed the feminine movement, not even patriarchy, as much as the feminist movement. Yes, that's what I say. What happened, essentially, is that we, we wanted to fight, which is not a feminine thing, by the way. Yeah. Females, that fighting is a forward-moving energy. So essentially the way that women, it's not like women are just passive. Passive has nothing to do with, with divine feminine. Divine feminine is a very powerful energy, yeah. but it's power in receptivity. Yeah. It's power in softness. It's kind of like you can't look at water and just because water is soft or pliable, say that water is not, wow. not powerful. Wow. It wears down stone. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, it, but it's that energy essentially, which we were not capable of fully embodying. Granted, we are, you know, physically weaker, most of us. And so what happened is over the centuries, men who are out of alignment, not in divine masculine, we have never seen divine masculine, that's something that we have to understand as women, Be because of out of alignment masculinity, essentially, we were um, completely subjugated for years and years, and it was all about what masculine is going to tell you to do, yet again, nothing to do with actual expression of divine feminine or masculinity. And so what we started to do was rebel. And by rebelling, we became men. That's what we did. Yeah. We basically said, we can do exactly what you can do. And so, uh, to be honest, 
even though there's, I mean, nobody can deny that, that there are some aspects that came through the, f the feminist movement that really benefited us. For example, we can have jobs. Thank God we're not like being forced to sit at home it, for those of us where that's not the divine expression. For some of us it is. But what really, what really went south with that is that when we started fighting, we started fighting to be men. Yeah, that's true. Not fighting to be women. And so you see those pictures, you know, like the classic poster, my favorite one, slash least favorite one, is this picture, is, I can do it. It's a woman that's doing this, right? That is a woman who has suppressed all the aspects of her femininity and is doing nothing but trying to be a man in a man's world, regardless of whether she has a vagina or not. And so what you watch is way more fertility issues. You watch t the breast cancer rate explode through the roof. And so all of these, these manifestations we're seeing are in the large part because of that huge energetic misalignment which we aligned with in the you know when we were at that age we're uh, in the 60s 70s we're denying our feminine side so that's what happened totally 100% it, you know. because we because we decided yeah. that it's weak yeah exactly exactly no, that's absolutely true so like this is what what makes me what drives me nuts is you know the women who are like I'm a feminist and I'm like you could not hate femininity more if you tried in my, uh, like I said, in the, in the book, right, this is the new version of the book, and I've had, I, there's two editors that are working on it, because I'm, I signed with a publisher, and one of them, uh, she doesn't know me, I don't really know her, and she is, I think she's very, the chapters where I wrote about feminine energy and about femininity, oh, we had some back and forth, because she was not, not happy, uh, she, she what, what was it that she was saying, uh, when, when, I don't know, when, whenever I was saying anything about being feminine and you know receiving like you said things like that she did not agree and anyways it all it, there was one part where i wrote um about being more uh about fe fe feminism has nothing to do uh with femininity or something like that and she mentioned uh she was like oh no but uh who said that being fe that feminist uh, or feminist should be feminine but i was like but no it doesn't anyways it was really a back and forth about that so i know there's uh, a big fight, not a fight, but there's a, there's a lot, still a big conversation to be had about that, about those topics that I think are so, so interesting and so fascinating, really. So the last question that I would have for you, the last topic that I would like for us to dive into would be about uh, sexuality. So let's talk a little bit about sex. Uh, but in the spiritual world, uh, you mentioned in some of the videos, and I, I know in spirituality that they, they mention a lot that you can reach, if we can say like that, enlightenment through sexuality. So talk a little bit about that and how can that be, be done and accomplished? <laughs> okay, so a state of enlightenment. What you're doing when you're reaching a state of enlightenment is you are matching the vibrational frequency of source or God itself. So you are holding that perspective. That's all enlightenment means. Now it just so happens that the perspective of source or God is absent of ego. And ego is an idea of a separate self. So the reason that orgasm has been used throughout the centuries and sexuality in general has been used throughout the centuries to reach a state of enlightenment is because sex innately dissolves the ego. Let's call it, I mean, let's assume that we're talking about the correct kind of sex. We're not talking about out of alignment sex where we're using each other as mutual masturbation tools. Yeah. Um, if we're talking like genuine, like spiritual connected sex mm -hmm. in the moment of orgasm and even before then, you begin to lose your sense of separate self. That's true. You become, become one. So when ego cracks essentially and you don't have a separate self and you're starting to merge with someone entirely, that is a doorway and an opening to the idea or the sensation or the realization of oneness. You also wake up your kundalini, which is essentially dor mostly dormant, depends on who you're talking to. But basically, in most people, it's a dormant uh, personal energy. And we, we like to think that sexual energy is different than, than energy, just basic energy, like life force energy, but it's the same. So when, you are, when you're engaged in a sex act in a conscious way, you are awakening your kundalini energy. So that's almost like saying, okay, soul, time to wake up. We're ready to play. So you'll watch all of the person light up. You'll watch all of the chakras completely open during the sexual experience in the same way that it does when we meditate. 
So the best way I would say to use sexuality to reach a state of enlightenment is to get to the place where you're having sex consciously, where it's not just about physical gratification. It's about in this moment, I want to take you in completely. This is especially when it comes to like a female pursuit, we're all about receptivity. We got to get ourselves to a space when we're engaged in sex where consciously we are like open completely, like all of us to the person that we're with and letting ourselves be completely taken. Now that right there is going to be a real trust issue for most of us, yeah. you know, but if we're willing to come up against those walls and to consciously walls to release in the act of sex, then we will have an open door to get ourselves to this perspective, like, you know, wow, it's almost like a mini experience. That's what the orgasm has been called the mini death. Right. I don't know if you know that, but, um, yeah, our sex has been thrilling. And a lot, for a lot of us, it's not. It's like you get drunk at a bar and you go sleep with the guy, because why? Because it feels good. And it makes us feel good about ourselves for 10 seconds. But that's the, def that's like the very definition of unconscious sex. And also I think you have a lot of videos, right, about uh, that, that topic, about sexuality and everything. And I think uh, people can go, of course, on your channel to, to learn more about that because I think that's so incredibly fascinating. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. I think that we covered a lot of topics in a short video. But again, if anyone wants to learn more, they can definitely go on your channel. There's a lot of material. Uh, how often do you uh, put out new videos? Is it once a week? Is it a... I put out a new video every Saturday. Every Saturday. Perfect. So it is real fun because people don't know what I'm going to be talking about. And what I will do essentially is I, I will... Uh, look at the dominant questions that I've been receiving through emails that are submitted and I'm going to pick essentially a topic for each Saturday. Okay. So most people who get addicted to the series, they're like, what are you going to do this week? Right, exactly. So, you never know. Yeah, it's like every subject under the sun, swear to God. Like, if you have any question, it's worthwhile just going there and typing in that question because most likely there's already a video on it. <laughs> no, well, I really believe that when it comes to spirituality, your channel is the go-to channel. You know, the spiritual catalyst, I really think it's the go-to channel. Also, people can go on your website. They can yep. see uh, when your next workshops are. I believe your next workshop is going to be in L.A. in March, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken. So for people who yes. are in L.A., definitely go check that out. I think even me, well, no, I think I'm going to be in L.A. In, in April. If not, I would have went for sure. Um, but yeah, and also, of course, your books. So that's, uh, that's, what are the titles again? The first one is The Sculptor in the Sky. Okay. The second one is um, Shadows Before Dawn, Finding the Light of Self-Love Through Your Darkest Times. And the third one, which is going to be released this fall, is the completion process, which is a process which facilitates healing from trauma. Wow, I love that. I love your titles. They're so good. That's amazing. I'm going to check that out, too. So for everyone, like I said, go on her YouTube channel, on her website, and also go check out her books. Uh, she has really amazing material. Thank you so much for your time. Is there one last thing that you would like to say to uh, everyone watching? Don't take that so seriously. That's true, right? <laughs> That's absolutely true. No, it's true. It really is. And, and, and spirituality, I think that's really a, a, a very important thing to understand, to not take life too seriously. So once again, everyone, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't forget, of course, to subscribe for new videos every single Wednesday in English and in French on Tuesdays and uh, in Spanish on Thursdays. And also new uh, series, Alexandra at Home, on Saturdays or in the weekends. And also, of course, in the comments section down below, let us know what would be uh, other topics that you would like us to talk about. So for Teal, for her channel, maybe some inspiration for her and also for me, what are other interesting topics that you would be interested in learning about. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in, and I will see you very soon. Thank you again, Teal. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay. Did you like this video? If so, here's three very simple things that I want you to do. First of all, subscribe to this channel. Subscribe to this channel because you get free videos every single week. So of course you don't want to miss that. The second thing that I want you to do is I want you to go on my website, alexandravilawell.com and subscribe also to my email list because every week I send you content by email that you don't see here on Alexandra TV, but it's free content with coaching techniques, strategies, so you don't want to miss that either. And the third thing that I want you to do is I want you to share this video. Share it on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, email it to a friend or even call a friend and say you need to go watch this. As Maya Angelou once said, when you learn, teach. 
So everything that you learned today, make sure you share it and you teach it to someone. I look forward to seeing you next week for another episode of Alexandra TV. And until then, don't forget to love life, others, and yourself.